Okay, so we're gonna get started here for this evening. Thank you for uh, being here at this early hour in Vegas. Hopefully everybody had a good time last night. Um, so today's panel is about getting started on YouTube. <clears throat> so I'm really looking forward to this panel um, because uh, obviously it's a YouTube sort of a panel, but at the same time it's a really great SEO panel, which helps all the time. So for today, I have my fellow internet colleague here, uh, Nate Chu, who's a video strategist and coach for the USA Today Network. And so, yeah, Nate, uh, can you tell us a bit about um, your work and what you do? Yeah, I've been working with the USA Today Network um, for see, eight years now. Um, most recently, I uh, now work mainly with um, the Austin American Statesman and the Oklahoman, um, mainly working on uh, with them on video stuff. Uh, but since 2022, uh, the USA Today Network Local has started to make a push to uh, revamp our efforts on YouTube, um, in part because we saw the audience opportunities there, um, but we also saw uh, opportunities for us to generate revenue uh, on YouTube as well. So that's a little bit about uh, why we started to push for YouTube. And a lot of it came from um, a video that I'm gonna share with you later today. Um, just, it kind of went viral, for lack of a better word, and uh, really inspired me to get involved and really see, you know, where can we continue to grow in this space. So first I'm going to share this slide and kind of go through why um, YouTube is an opportunity specifically for news organizations today. Um, the usage of YouTube went up uh, during the pandemic, you know, over 80% of US adults were using YouTube. It's come down a little bit since then, since not everybody's at home all the time, but it's still an extremely popular space online. And a quarter of U.S. adults say that they get their news on YouTube. You know, that's a sizable chunk. Um, and of those new cons news consumers on YouTube, you know, they all, 33% of them, express a high trust in mainstream news outlets and journals. So not only is YouTube a space where there's an audience for news, there's an audience for news there where they are willing to trust journalists who are willing to engage with them. So there's a space there for us to really uh, build uh, trust in our brands and our journalists are there as well. And finally as well, uh, YouTube is a space where we can generate revenue um, from our views. You know, if you're gonna monetize your videos on YouTube, uh, you have to have, you know, at least a thousand subscribers. Um, I think it's 40,000 watch hours. Exactly if I'm wrong. Um, but it, over the long haul, it is feasible to get there in the local newsrooms. It is feasible to get there for sure. And in terms of whether or not YouTube is a great um, referral mechanism to bring people's revenue to your sites, you know, there are times where it can, it can work. Um, but if you're considering getting on YouTube, you know, it's not really the best place to go um, if you're looking to generate referrals. Um, it's really more of a space for you to build a, you know, audience for your videos on YouTube and for you to generate revenue uh, for your, for your users. So I've got two case studies here that I'd like to share with you today um, before we get into things a little bit deeper. Um, first was this um, pilot project that I launched uh, last August. Um, I talked with a bunch of local newsrooms of their sports departments and said, hey, I know a bunch of you have podcasts on your, on your sports programs, or especially in the football season, season coming up. I think it'd be great if you could get some video recordings of those podcasts and try them out on YouTube and see if there's an audience for that content in that space. And so one of the channels I was participating was Fox Central, which is run by the Des Moines Register's sports department. And earlier on in the year, um, they had decided, you know, we need to revamp our, our efforts on YouTube so that we can monetize. So at the start of the year, they were not monetizing their efforts, but by the time football season came around, by the time it was ready to start doing these podcasts, they were there. And so they were able to start making money on those podcasts um, on YouTube. And those podcasts really succeeded for them and for others on YouTube in part because those podcasts had a deep engagement rate. Uh, to make it clear, on YouTube it's possible that you could have a video with higher views but earns less revenue than a video with less views but has a higher engage time because YouTube is rewarding that engage time because they're able to play more ads on that video. Um, so as a channel, you're able to make more video, make more money I should say, on videos like that. Um, so for them, it's been something that they've just continued to do. You know, football season's come and gone, but they've done through basketball season, um, through um, softball season, and baseball season as well. 
So continue to do that, talk about football in the off season. So it's just a consistent thing that they've been able to continue to do. Um, and they've seen um, the revenue be consistent with them there as well. And then another case study um, is an example from Uvalde, which I worked on with the Austin American Statesman. Um, we had the exclusive surveillance footage this last summer, which was obviously very difficult to work with. Um, but we made the conscious decision to um, share the full video on YouTube in spirit of transparency. You know, I'm talking a lot about revenue share today too, but with this video in particular, we made the conscious decision uh, not to monetize it. We made the conscious decision to not turn on comments. We made the conscious decision um, to edit the full video ethically so that it met our standards. Um, again, the uh, purpose was there, there was to meet the audience where they were at. And as you can see there in that, uh, in the bottom right there, um, people were not just looking for that video, those are search keywords that people were looking for when they found the video, they were also looking for us specifically as well. Um, so because we decided to post it there, it meant that we were able to meet the audience where, where they were at. And with a video like this, with as controversial as it was, we also put in a link in that video to say, this is why we decided to publish the video. And so that video was an example of a video that gener did generate healthy referrals from YouTube to our site to read, you know, why we decided to publish that video. So with that, I'm gonna go in and share the anatomy of a YouTube win we, that we had. Um, this was a video that I published in 2021 and really was a video once I saw how it did, the type of referrals it generated, how people were discovering it, um, really inspired me to continue to get involved and continue to push for videos to be pushed out on YouTube, both on the sites that I was working with, um, but both uh, also as a network as a whole. So it's a video of Dave Grohl with the Food Fighters. He's an excellent storyteller. He's very dynamic. He knows how to tell a story. Um, and so it turned out, I was told after the fact that a Reporter and Austin had got this great hour long Zoom interview with him. The video was, you know, low resolution. It wasn't, you know, it was a little bit hard to watch because it was grainy. So that was, you know, as a video person, you're a little bit disappointed that you hadn't got that information ahead of time that, you know, this great interview was happening on video ahead of time. You would have done some things differently. Um, but they covered a wide range of topics. At this point, Dave was uh, promoting his new book. Um, so they talked about a variety of things, but something that stood out to me editing that video was that he talked about this really viral moment that actually happened in Austin back in 2018 when he brought a fan on stage to play guitar with the band. And I can't, you know, confirm this 100%, but it was probably one of the first instances of the Foo Fighters doing this. Um, and if you follow the Foo Fighters, if you're a Foo Fighters fan, you know that for a while they kept doing this. They kept bringing fans on stage to play different songs with them. So it kind of turned into a trend for them. Um, and so I thought that was a really unique moment, a really interesting story to hear it just from Dave himself and why you know, he, he wants to do that. Um, and so I edited a shorter video uh, for our website and then a little bit of a longer one um, for YouTube. And I'm gonna play it for you guys now so you kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. When I was young, it's really fun learning to play the drums by sitting on my bedroom floor with a record player next to me, I would learn my favorite albums front to back. That's how I learned to play, just by listening and playing on these pillows on my floor. I felt different than my, than my friends, and growing up in this little suburb outside of D.C. in Springfield, I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel like I fit in, and when I saw the B-52s, it kind of like, it, it awakened this feeling in me that was like, oh shit, look at these crazy motherfuckers. I want to be like that, you know? That's what I want to do. I don't want to be like Kiss. I don't want to be like Zeppelin. I want their fucking ideal like they sound. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, so I was kind of already on that path. And then when I went to Chicago, um, and my cousin took me to see my first show. Like, I'd never seen a live band before. And here I am, like, belly up to the lip of the stage with this fucking punk rock band in front of me, playing four chords, people dying on my head, and fucking guys right in my face screaming. And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, hold on a second, not only do I love this, but I can do this. You know, I can't play like Jimmy Page. I can't fucking play like John Long, but I can do that. And there was something about 
the independence of it, the, you know, they didn't need like a cigar shop and fucking record executive to allow them to do this. It was like, they were hauling their gear to this fucking corn bar and doing it themselves. And that's really what inspired me. I was like, I'm going back to Virginia. I'm, I'm gonna fucking do this myself because I don't need it. If, if that's all you need to do, fuck four chords and a bunch of people chucking around, like, fuck, I can do that. And um, that's what really inspired me most. And then the energy of the music and, you know, the intention, but that, that was really, that was the genesis of that. He bought his own fucking band. I always had this twisted fantasy that I'd go to my favorite band's show. Someone would come up and say, I'm sorry, can't play tonight. There's something happened to our drummer. Unless there's someone out there that knows every one of our records front to back. And then I would raise my hand and jump up on stage and like save the fucking day. I said, sign up. Can I play my fingers? I'm sitting there looking at him all night, holding this fucking sign up. And I'm like, God damn it, his arms must be tired. And his fucking makeup's coming off. And so I, I had to give it to him. I was just like, he worked hard for this shit. He's been holding that fucking sign for two and a half hours. No clue, of course, never met him before. No clue that he could even play. I just thought, okay, this could either be the greatest thing that's ever happened or a total train wreck. So when I was young, that was this fantasy of mine that I'd get to do that with my favorite band. And every time I bring out one of those people on stage, I kind of, I have to think that they've had that same fantasy too. That, that to be able to jump up on stage with a band they enjoy and perform in front of thousands of people, um, you know, it not only brings them to it, but it brings the audience and, 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 and me as well. Like, a, a lot of fucking joy.
is it the same query? Does it include some of the same text that I put in my query when I came to YouTube search? Um, you've got 100 characters to work with there. Um, as you can see there, I've got some of the uh, highlight as well. We've got terms like Dave Roll, Kiss Guy, um, which actually had plenty of search interest. Um, some other terms as well. Um, in the description field, you've got more characters. You've got 5,000 characters to work with. It's good to use some of your lesser used terms in that space. So you can see, for example, we've got this guy's actual name, which also was carried search interest for so long. Um, you've got the name of the song that they decided to play. Um, you've got the, but you've also got some of those same terms that were in um, the headline as well. So you're repeating some of them, and that's okay. Um, it's almost a way to tell uh, YouTube, hey, we have a thing in line. And using some of those same terms in your tags can be good too. If you have those three kind of lined up, have you know a dominant keyword in each of those spaces um, that's a good a green flag uh, for YouTube and then also like I said yeah first tags carry on you know, some SEO weight as well so I think um, as far as um, headlines or descriptions like um, is it like cyclists or like news sources like does YouTube prefer like a more conversational sort of headline and you either or yeah I think it's it's definitely a good balance because you are writing it Sometimes they're topic adjacent, 
Um, but that's another space where people will, people will discover your videos. Obviously, there's YouTube search, you're putting in a query, you look at your results, and you make a decision based on what you're seeing, um, what video you're going to watch. And then, then there's external, um, that would be everything else. Um, so that includes things like people discovering your video through Google search. If you're on Google, obviously there's a video tab. Oftentimes they will recommend a YouTube video there. They might also recommend a video from your website there, depending on what the query is. Um, but YouTube results can also show up there. They can show that they should, someone shared the video on their Facebook page, and someone embedded the Facebook on their website or their blog. Um, it really is just kind of a lump sum of everything. And an example of this data referral video, each one of these um, referral types um, generated views for us. So okay, how about Google? Is it, is it if uh, you embed your YouTube video on your site? So. Yeah, if you're embedding your YouTube video, it's gonna, YouTube will log it as an external view. And to be clear when I'm talking about these things, this is just what you would see in YouTube Studio to tell you, you know, where your views are coming from, and knowing this can really help um, you come up with a good strategy to identify, you know, what is the referral type that these types of videos are getting um, are we competitive in this space. So browse features, and this is pretty common depending on what your video is. Um, browse features, you know, initially were the first thing that really blew up because people were watching videos on this topic. Now, in the case of the Dave Grohl video, Two days before we published a video, a major account with over 300,000 subscribers published a video for the data roll. So that therefore meant that people were coming to the platform watching videos on this topic. Our video shows up, They're, they've already watched the other one, let's watch another video about data roll. I'm already watching videos about the food buyers, let's keep it going. Um, so that's part of the reason the browse features work so well for this video. Um, it's because of that video and also related to buyer videos at the same time. You know, they're a pretty popular group. Um, and again, you can see some spikes there. You know, that's from some different news events featured the food buyers over the last several months. You're seeing that spike at the end because they released a new album. Um, so people are watching more and more food buyer videos on the platform, which means our videos therefore getting uh, recommended as well. Suggested videos drove traffic too, and some of those suggested videos were videos of this actual moment happening way back in 2018 as well. So even though that happened way back in 2018, because it was such a viral moment in this case, um, people are still coming to the platform and watching, you know, footage of the same thing happening um, today. And so people watch that moment happen, our videos recommended to them, and says, hey, Dave Grohl's gonna explain why he does this. People are going to therefore decide, hey, I want the backstory. I want to learn more about why this actually happens. And so that's part of a, why it's been successful there. Um, so those videos have generated you know, over 100,000 pages, or 100,000 views for us, I should say, uh, to the video. Um, so that's been helpful to see as well. Um, with the decline of referrals from browse features, like I said, you know, that being a dominant referral mechanism at the beginning, and this is over time generated the second, uh, been the second biggest traffic source so far. And then YouTube search, again, it's really gonna depend on what your video is. If it's, if it's trending or breaking, or if it's something that's evergreen like this was, um, to really you know, decide what keywords you're going to use. Um, but YouTube search over time has become the biggest driver. So when you're thinking about putting your video out there on YouTube, if it does have more staying power, if you think it's gonna be relevant for several months, let alone several years, you're gonna be wanting to look at optimizing with those evergreen terms in mind because it can really generate views for you over time. You can see that some of the top results here were things like Kiss Guy, Food Fighters, um, His Name, etc. Those all were different search for terms that people use to find our video or, or find videos on that topic and just, just so happen to decide to watch all ours. But it's because we use those terms throughout in our headline and in our description that people were able to discover. And then I would call external views kind of a reward, it's kind of a bonus, um, because Google search is picking it up, people are sharing this video on Facebook because they like it, people putting it on a blog, they like it, you know, that's kind of a nice bonus because you follow all best practices. So next I have a checklist um, to really identify, you know, before you start 
posting a video on YouTube and the steps you take after you've done it. So first is, as I said, use Google Trends. That is gonna be the best way that you can really identify what terms are people using to try to find content on a topic that you have a video, that you have a piece of content on. And I would kind of dive deep on those, on those topics. So if you type in a topic and you see a related term, also put that into Google Trends. Also go in and see, you know, how are people just using this term? Um, that's really gonna help you decide, you know, what terms to use in your video. And then kind of in that same way, you're also gonna wanna use those same terms and go directly to YouTube yourself and see if I, search this, if I YouTube this, what results come up? Is it a new video? Is it an old video? Is it a video from a channel that is consistently posting on um, this topic? And if so, what's the timeline? You know, how consistently are they posting on this? If you can identify when you're, basically your market um, competitor is posting on this topic and there are people watching it and you post it around the same time, you have a better shot at showing up in the browse features, for example. Um, so really that can really impact your timing, especially if you're using, if you're covering a topic better than they actually are. They just have to stay, they just build the audience up. Um, and then, like I said, consider building a custom thumbnail, um, adding info card options. Um, you really want to use an, an image that is going to stand out because, again, if you search something on YouTube, you're seeing a sea of video results, right? What makes your video stand out apart from the headline? Oftentimes people are not just looking for the headline, they're looking for a thumbnail that really conveys what they're looking for. So if you have something and that is emotional, something that is a close-up image, that's gonna be you know, helpful, in part because a lot of people are watching YouTube not just on their desktops, but they're also watching it on their phones, right? There's also people watching it on their smart TVs too. So really think about that as well. Um, so is there space in your image to include a little bit of teaser text to make clear, you know, this is what this video is about, this is what this video covers. Um, and then info cards, for anyone that's watching on YouTube, um, occasionally in the top right corner of the, uh, of the video player, you'll see different things recommended to you. Please like and subscribe. Please, you know, watch this playlist. Please click this link to our website. Um, so there's ways within YouTube Studio, once you've uploaded your video, that you're, you're able to include relevant links, relevant coverage, and to kind of bring the audience deeper into what you're offering as well. Now you need to be careful about what you put there because what is gonna incentivize someone to click away from that video once you experience, right? If it's a link to a story that covers the exact same thing that the video is already showing, that's probably not a reason for them to click away. But if, it, but if it offers them something different, if it offers them like a reason, for example, like we did with Evolve, why would we publish this controversial video? You know, there's stronger incentives to decide to click there. So you know, you want to weigh, you know, what what is going to be relevant to this audience. And then after posting, um, assess, assess what referrals are driving views in YouTube Studio. You know, we don't want to just post and then not come up with a strategy for deciding to invest time in this platform. We really want to see, you know, what is driving the audience to watch our videos on this topic. What's working, what's not working, and then kind of uh, make some moves from there. Um, if you're getting healthy views from your browser suggested videos, um, you know, do that market research. Really identify, you know, what other channels are posting on this topic. What are the suggested videos? that are generating views for you. Um, do they have other suggested videos? Do they have other videos that you would also have topics on? And how can you kind of match up your SEO and your videos with those that you can also be discovered? Um, another best practice to follow, which is a great best practice for any uh, news organization with a social media presence is to engage in the comments. You know, as I said earlier, 33% of news consumers on YouTube have a high trust in mainstream news. We can push that even higher by engaging with people and showing them we're not just a brand on this platform, that we're real people behind the brand, engaging with them, answering their questions, um, bringing them deeper into our depth of coverage. And then lastly is rinse and repeat, you know, develop that strategy that reflects what formats and what topics resonate. You're gonna learn through this process that, you know, different videos, edits, different uh, video titles, etc. 
um, are not going to work. And that's part of the process is to, to try to identify, you know, how are we going to be successful here? You know, not every video that you and your team produces makes sense for YouTube, and that's okay. There's other platforms where it has higher potential for use. Um, when you're thinking about YouTube, it's really best to be strategic because you're going to be more impactful with the videos that you post there. Um, and you don't want to just post a video, you know, once a year. You do need to have some sort of consistency, um, but there's definitely a balance to be had there. So real quick, uh, three quick takeaways for reaching audience on YouTube is, is picking a topic that resonates with the YouTube audience. If that topic has coverage on that platform, it does not have to, uh, if the topic has little coverage on that platform, it's likely not a good fit. So there might be other spaces where your, your stories, where your video, et cetera, uh, might resonate better than YouTube if that's the case. Not everything has to go on YouTube, uh, but there is a potential for a lot of it to do well there. You're gonna wanna conduct that keyword, keyword research to see does it resonate on the platform. See how that talk, see how the audience is searching for the topic by using Google Trends. Assess what results you get by searching those keywords on the platform. And then lastly, deliver on what audiences are looking for. You know, we don't want to push clickbait out there. We want to be clear with the audience about if you click this video, this is what we're providing you. This is the question that we're answering in this video. Um, this is the human story that we're telling by sharing this video. Um, we want to use a headline that really delivers and really balances, like Jason was saying, you know, the needs of you know what the search interest is, but also um, that a human is ultimately deciding to watch the video. Um, they're the ones that are going to decide to click on it at the end of the day. All right. What? Yeah. Thanks, Nate. Um, returning to the question, as far as like um, like because I, I have a personal YouTube channel as well, like like for gaming that does pretty well, but so I get a lot of questions. But the, one of the com most common questions I get is like, what equipment do I need? And like, and then there's that first like, first comp through a thousand, which is when you how many subscribers you need to be monetized, right? It's like a thousand. What advice do you have for people to get through that first like barrier? Because I see a lot of people quitting before they get to a thousand because they get discouraged. Sure. Yeah, I think keep posting it and also see you know what what are your comments looking like too? You know what kinds of questions, what kinds of conversations are happening there? Is there space to really answer those questions through com through video content? Now, I see that a lot from YouTubers saying it's like I saw this conversation in the comments. Here I am answering it. So it's that that relationship that you have with your audience that you can really grow in that way because if they've already come to discover you in some way and they're going to come back if you answer their question, you can really build that loyalty, really build them into those belt kind of subscribers. Um, so that, that's one thing that I would also recommend. I would also say that you want to be consistent about posting. Um, if you're discouraged and, and it's difficult, definitely okay to take a break. Um, when you come back to decide to post, you know, if you need to make the conscious decision, is this worth my time? Is this worth my effort based on the content that I have available to me? Um, and you might make the decision that it's not. You might make the decision that, you know, the video content that I'm producing is reaching a more targeted audience on a place like like TikTok, for example, because of uh, the way that's located. YouTube isn't the answer for everything, but it definitely can be an answer, and it does offer things that other platforms do not like, like revenue. And another common question is like, what's the best time to post? I, I assume it would be, it, it depends on the situation. It absolutely depends on the situation, yes. Um, some videos, in part because of how YouTube is used globally, you know, you might be surprised to find that your video did well from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. because it's getting watched in another country, depending on what the topic was that you did. Um, but if you're doing something, um, I'm going to borrow an example from, say, sports, you know, uh, all ESPN and a bunch of those other folks, you know, they're posting those videos from their uh, morning talk shows in the morning. You want to be relevant in that time space too because that's when they're posting and therefore people are going to be watching videos looking for analysis on that certain topic. So they might have a really broad look at that day's news, right? But you can give a more specific um, read, especially as a local newsroom, and be like, I'm delivering the answer based on you being a fan of this specific team, this specific franchise. And then as far as the length, like uh, that, that can be really controversial sometimes when I look at my comments. Like obviously like uh, YouTube wants you to have like I think like eight minutes before they add like mid-rolls. Yeah, they used to be eight. Yeah. yeah, so it used to be ten, so it's better. But I also noticed in my comments, like I have like viewers who specifically look at my time 
and if they see that it's exactly eight, they get kind of upset because it's like, oh, I need to strike the intro video to make the eight thing. Like, what, how do you decide how long a video should be? Um, for me, um, it's just based on the video that I have, I have available to me, and kind of making that decision between do I post something now or do I wait till I have a little bit more. Um, and you know, that's kind of the struggle that newsrooms often have, you know, do we decide to write something right now and put it on a website, or do we decide to add a little bit more context before we put it out there? That's kind of the internal struggle we have online, right? And the same is true with YouTube, especially when um, there's, uh, uh, like, Wild Web, for example. You know, I work with Hannah with uh, Oklahoma City and, and Austin, Texas, where she's, you know, both of those uh, markets see a good amount of uh, weather, and so making that decision, I've got this footage of this tornado, do I put it out there on YouTube right now, or do I wait until I have additional footage, footage of damage, et cetera, to wait to put that there by way, I know there's interest right now on the platform. So it is kind of a give and take, it really depends on what it is. Um, but if you can post a longer video from a press conference, you know, if you're at a press conference and someone says something outlandish, you can still use that outlandish bit in the headline, but use like a full 15 minute uh, press conference online I provide a little bit there. Do, does that have chapters though as far as if you have a long video? Sorry about what? Oh, it's adding chapters. You can add chapters too. And chapters, because chapters, when you add chapters in YouTube, that actually flows into the description. So chapters, for those who are not available, we don't know, in your description, if you add chapters, it will add like the time code for your video. So it will say uh, from five seconds to 43 seconds, this thing is happening. And so within that, you've got an additional space for SEO, actually. So you can use what I've done with, um, with those natural disaster videos um, is put in the locations because people are not just looking for a Texas tornado on YouTube, they're also looking for their specific community oftentimes. And so because they know where it is or they know the county name. And so I will use that as an opportunity to put in that SEO in that space as well. And so if my video is that long, I've got video from a bunch of different spaces, um, that's another thing that I do with uh, SEO as well. So does anybody have any questions from the call? Yes, sir. Uh, I host the daily history pop culture uh, feature called Time Rewind, and I've been putting it up on all the platforms. We've got almost 43,000 followers on TikTok, and the engagement there is off the chart. I mean, like in a couple hours since I put today's show up, it's had almost 800 plays, uh, you know, quite a few likes. But the, the, the content just flounders on YouTube. I've like had 73 followers for like six months, and I cannot move the needle. And I've been doing most of the, you know, the, the things that you recommended. So I don't know if it's like there's either too many hashtags, or you know, what is it that's not working on YouTube that seems to be very successful on the other? must be doing something wrong. Without having seen what it looks like, it's hard to say, but I would say that it's it's a little bit more difficult to win with that topic here on YouTube because YouTube is so search specific. And so search tends to be reflective of the news of the day a little bit more versus historical, versus TikTok is a really great space to engage in stuff like that, like you're experiencing. Yeah. Because people are watching a lot of videos like that, on that space because of the way it's being told in that space means that they're more likely to have that content recommended to them. So on YouTube, um, I think it can, 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 it can come down to trying to answer a very specific query around a significant historical event potentially. I mean, I'm saying this without having seen, you know, I'm not sure if you've done that or anything like that, so I can't speak to that. Um, but there might be interest in say, we just had the D-Day anniversary, for example. What, what questions were people asking answered in a video format that would work, you know, hold the long haul, for example. You know, there's going to be interest on the anniversary a little bit, and it's going to come back down. Yeah. But is there something around that topic area that you can kind of, kind of massage a little bit? Does that make sense? Right. No, you make an interesting point, because, for example, it, this did not work on Twitter, because Twitter, it's more in the moment. What's happening? Breaking news. My you know, opinion of something. This particular format, history, pop culture, this I finally just pulled it off, it was ridiculous. I get like two plays, this or that. So I guess you're right, it's really just understanding the content and, and the audience in which you're with. Right, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes, Mike. Yeah, I have a two, uh, two part question. One, like Google itself, do you get penalized if you have multiple sites posting the same video with duplicate content? Um, like with Google, the old Panda rule, if you have multiple sites that are posting the same story, you all get the flag, it's kind of spammy. Do you all get you know, flagged as duplicate content? And part two, 
broadcast television video clip of content to be uploaded versus a person sitting at a desk in a Zoom call with super quick matter being posted. What, you know, if you have a high quality video versus a lower quality production value, is there a X factor of, of engagement because of the high quality video? So first question, I would say, so for, let me give you an example. So my news organization publishes a video on our website with headline A. I then want to use that same video on YouTube. If I use the same headline, Google's probably not going to reward it, the, the, uh, the site, because it's the same stuff. Um, so that's what I'm just talking about. When you're looking at Google Trends, you really want to be sure that you're writing those headlines that are reflective of what the YouTube search interest is so that you are getting that audience, because that's what you're there for, right? You're there for that audience. So in terms of being dinged, you just want to be careful that you make sure that your headlines are different in different spaces. Um, to your second question, the, the quality of video question is a difficult one to quantify because it really depends on all these things. It really depends on what your title. It really depends on what your video has. That video that I have with Dave Grohl, that's really low resolution video. That's really low resolution B-roll that I got permission to. Cell phone footage from 2018 from someone standing in the crowd at a concert. It's not high quality. The story that he tells resonates regardless. So it depends on the content that you have, and it really just depends on the, the query that you're trying to answer at the end of the day. If you if you decide it's worth the, the effort to do that because that video that is high quality is resonating by doing shorter clips on somewhere like TikTok, on Twitter, then maybe it makes sense for you to across the board have that high quality video because you can use it across the board versus if you just have like a Zoom interview and it doesn't resonate in the same way in those other spaces, maybe in terms of your collective video strategy, it makes sense to invest more in doing a higher quality video. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have to go. We have a nice panel.